We are going to spend a full hour with the gentleman on your screen. His name is Mark Zandi. He is chief economist at, at economy.com, which is a Moody's company. And we're going to talk with him and take your telephone calls about the situation in the U.S. and global financial markets. He has a book out that's available in bookstores around the country called Financial Shock, a 360-degree look at the subprime mortgage implosion and how to avoid the next financial crisis. I'm going to ask you, because I've been listening all morning, Mr. Zandi, to the caller's theories about what, is, what got us here. And your book spends a lot of time with your analysis of what got us to where we are today. We need to find out how to go forward from here. But first, tell us how you think we got to this spot. Uh, okay, I'll peel back the onion one layer, uh, and then we can peel back more if, you, if, the, okay. reader, if the callers want to. Um, uh, most fundamentally, it's the housing boom and the subsequent bust. Um, house prices, which is a good proxy for the boom, doubled between 2000 and 2005. Since that time, they've fallen 20%. There were a lot of mortgages made during the boom uh, at the peak of housing values. A lot of bad mortgages, almost 15 million bad mortgages or mortgages at risk of uh, defaulting. And millions are defaulting. Uh, that's causing losses to the investors in those mortgages. Um, and those investors range from Lehman Brothers to Bear Stearns to Citigroup uh, to you and I through our investments uh, through these institutions. And it's undermining uh, their financial viability. It's undermining their capital, the cushion they need to operate as financial institutions. And some are failing. Uh, others are merging. Uh, the rest are in complete turmoil. And um, that's where we are today. That's how we got here today. It's the fundamentally, it's the the boom and now the bust. Well, I am going to ask two more onion-related peeling questions, I guess, which is that what caused the the rise, the quick rise in housing markets? Uh, we talked about the congressional and sort of Washington attitude of getting more people into homes. And at the same time, there was a post-9-11 period where the credit markets were stalled and the Federal Reserve uh, made money easier and cheaper to get. So how did that all play into the rise, steep rise in prices? Okay, so let's uh, peel back the onion a little bit more. Uh, the uh, economic policy since the Great Depression, now I'm really peeling it back for you, uh, has been designed to promote home ownership. And if you go back to the Great Depression, uh, it seemed like a really good idea. Home ownership rate was 45%, meaning 45% of households owned their own home. And I think we can all agree that owning a home is, is a good thing, not only for the person owning the home, but for the community in which they live. They're vested in the community. They want to make it better. They want to make uh, the economy better. And so economic policy was designed to get people into homes. And that, that's when Fannie Mae was uh, put together back in uh, the Great Depression in the 30s uh, to subsidize mortgage loans to, to households, uh, particularly lower middle income households. Uh, we have a mortgage uh, interest deduction, tax deduction. So if you pay mortgage interest, you can deduct it against uh, uh, against your taxes. Uh, it lowers the cost of housing. Uh, that co- costs taxpayers about $100 billion a year uh, in lost tax revenue. Just to give you a sen- sense of the magnitude of the subsidy we give to housing. So homeownership rate uh, increased uh, quite substantively. Uh, uh, we got into the Clinton administration. Uh, they th- thought homeownership should be promoted even more aggressively. Uh, they uh, uh, asked regulators to figure out ways to, to allow the banking system to extend up more credit. Got into the Bush administration. We got into uh, the, uh, the ownership society, which meant more home ownership. So we pushed uh, regulators to allow even, for even greater mortgage lending. And uh, so now we come into the current decade, and uh, uh, people were being asked, uh, lenders were being asked to be very aggressive in lending. And then they were empowered by what was going on in the financial system. We figured out a new way to take mortgage loans, package them as securities, and sell them off to investors. So a lot of global investors were pouring money into the mortgage market about the same time. And uh, lending got increasingly heated, uh, and lenders started competing and lowering standards. And at first, it was modest kinds of things, like if someone had a lower credit score, then the lender would ask for a bigger down payment. But at the peak of the frenzy, 2005, 2006, um, lending was completely, literally uh, out of control. Uh, no down payment, no low credit score, no credit score. Uh, didn't really care if you had a job or not. Uh, at least I wouldn't check if I was the lender. And so 
that's when the really bad lending occurred. And on top of it, people were regularly getting pitched for low interest home equity loans to and mortgage mortgage the value of the properties, anticipating that they would continue to go up and yeah. increasing their debt loads. Good point. So then you're a homeowner and now prices are rising rapidly because this, there's this lending frenzy. And also we were all buying into the idea that house prices would never decline and also thinking that it would rise strongly ad infinitum into the future because they had in the past. And uh, we started borrowing against the rising housing value. So the, the home would rise in price, say, in some places, 10% one year. And that for, say, it's a $250,000 home, that's an increase of $25,000 in value. So a lender would say, oh, well, why don't you borrow against that $25,000? Uh, and they would lend up to $25,000. And people would do it, and they would go out and take a vacation. Or some people would take it and do home improvement, uh, buy a car, who knows, so lots of different things. But obviously... Uh, that's now gone. That's not happening, and it's contributing to our economic problems. I want to give the viewers the, your, the telephone line so you can be part of this conversation, and we will get to calls in just a couple of minutes here because we've been at it for a while today, and I know many of you have been thinking about this and seeing reports on television and watching the Congress as this is being discussed in Washington and have lots on your minds about it. Republicans, 202-737-0001. Democrats, 202-737-0002. Line for Independence, 202-628-0205. And, Mr. Zandi, before we get to calls, I, I hope you'll indulge me here, but I'd like to have people know who they're listening to. Sure. So your uh, your resume, your, your, bro- your description on the back of your book and on your website all... I'm a touts- good guy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it touts your education at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School. Where does that put you as an economic philosophy? Uh, well, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I'm a McCain advisor, uh, economic advisor, but I'm a registered Democrat. So, you know, you figure it out. I'm somewhere in between the, the two. Uh, I sympathize with some of the things that uh, Democrats um, often worry about um, regulation and lack thereof. Uh, and I also uh, worry about some of the things Republicans are concerned about, the uh, in promoting investment and long-term economic growth and, and policies designed to do that. So, you know, I think I'd call myself an eclectic economist. I wouldn't put myself in any camp. I, I try to be pragmatic about uh, the economy and policy related to the economy. With regard to the regulation of the markets, are you in, uh, how, how do you view the amount of regulation necessary in our society? Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, the markets, uh, particularly the housing market and uh, financial markets, were uh, uh, not regulated enough. Uh, in fact, at, at, the, at the frenzied point in the mid part of the decade, I think it was largely unregulated. It was a, it was a very significant uh, contributing factor to what, what happened. Um, I think the uh, deregulation pendulum that had started swinging back in the 1980s and through the 1990s uh, got too far, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's part of the reason why we're here today. So I do think we need to rethink uh, uh, regulation and the regulatory framework uh, and, and bring the pendulum back. Okay. I'm going to spend uh, two more minutes on uh, what the reaction in Washington so far to stabilize the markets and then calls, I promise. So your view of the Treasury, the Fed, the Treasury and the Fed's intervention in several large companies and the decision in a, cur- a couple of cases not to intervene. How do you think they've been doing and what are the results going to be? Yeah, I, I think what they did was necessary and I think it will prevail. It will win the day. Um, I, w- I was quite surprised by the market's reaction yesterday. And we could talk about what what happened yesterday, but I, I ultimately think what the Treasury and Fed have done uh, will succeed. Uh, they put the you know full faith and credit of the United States behind the financial system. That was what they've done here, and uh, there's uh, that's pretty strong backing. It's still triple A, um, and uh, I think that'll that'll win the day. Um, we'll have to take on faith that they're deciding appropriately with respect to each of the institutions that they're uh, trying to uh, help or resolve their financial problems. They didn't help Lehman. They did help AIG. Um, you know, do I, is that the right thing that, to have done? I don't know. I think you need to be in the weeds looking at the balance sheet and looking at all the relationships that these institutions had with the rest of, rest of the financial system. But it, it has logic to it. I mean, they didn't help Lehman, and the financial system seems to have held together pretty well. They argued they needed to help AIG, and I can understand the arguments. If you sort of go through the, the tentacles of AIG through the system, you, you wonder to yourself, okay, there's a legitimate argument here that if AIG failed, it would take a lot of other financial institutions with it. And the Dow wouldn't have been down 450 points yesterday. It would have been down 1,000 points yesterday. So 
I, I think that was, you know, I, I don't know if it's the right thing for each individual case, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt.